Good morning from Oakland United Methodist Church. Here's something for you to think about uh, this morning. A poll taken by the Center for Governance, Governance of Change in the United Kingdom revealed that 25% of European citizens believe that robots and artificial intelligence algorithms would do a better job of making policy decisions than politicians would. In Germany and the uh, Netherlands, the figures are even higher. According to this poll, citizens throughout Europe are so delusioned by their political leaders that they believe robots and computers would do a better job of governing their countries than humans would. With our current situation in this country and the difficulties we see, I would lean toward this also. Now that's a sad commentary on our lack of trust in our leaders. When did we become so cynical? I personally am not quite ready to trust a robot or artificial intelligence programs to make policy decisions that decide our laws and our regulations and how we run our society. Not yet, anyway. And if you think about robot politicians are a little bit scary, then what about religious leaders? According to a recent uh, news story, Buddhist and Hindu and Protestant Christians, communities in Japan and China and India and Germany are now experimenting with robot priests who can provide pre-programmed blessings and even deliver sermons or perform funeral rites. What are the benefits of having a robot spiritual guide? Some people say that they won't have the biases of a, a human being. They can learn and update their software so that they can improve their interactions with humans. A Buddhist temple Steward in, in China had this to say about the robot priest who presided over his temple services. He said, this robot will never die. It'll just keep updating itself and evolving with artificial intelligence. We hope that it'll grow in wisdom to help people overcome even the most difficult troubles. Interesting, isn't it? A spiritual leader that will keep updating itself and evolving and never die. Does anyone see a problem with that? I do. Artificial intelligence may be able to evolve, but it will never know the power of the Holy Spirit guiding it. It may be able to update itself, but it will never have the spirit of truth living inside of it. And a spiritual leader who never faces his or her own death can't offer us an example of wisdom and grace or courage when we wrestle with the meaning of life. How do you live fully and faithfully in the limited time that you have on this earth? Can software program, uh, a program relate to the internal struggles of facing your own mortality? In our Bible passage today, Jesus knows that he's heading toward his death. He needs to know if his disciples trust his leadership. What will they remember of his message and his mission after he's gone? What is the one thing his disciples will need to carry on his work and transform the world? Jesus had good reason to ask these questions in chapter 13, the passage leading up to this one. Jesus had knelt down like the lowliest servant and washed the feet of the disciples. I'd say these men were in shock, humbled, confused or by his actions. But we only know for sure how Simon Peter and Judas felt. Simon objected, and he tried to stop Jesus. And Judas Iscariot simply left the group. He never returned to the disciples' fold. 
You know, we can profess our love all day long, but how do we prove it? Judas had lived with Jesus and eaten with him and ministered with him for three years. He had all the marks of someone who loved Jesus. But in the end, he betrayed the master. When you're in a leadership role, it's difficult to know whom to trust. People may follow you because they are drawn to your energy or your popularity or your vision. But leaders know that just because someone follows you, it doesn't mean they love you. It doesn't mean they'll carry on your work when you're not out there. How do you tell the difference? This was Jesus' last major rallying cry before his arrest and crucifixion. And he needed to know which of his disciples would tough it out and follow his example and which ones would give up and walk away. Which ones would fall on their sword for him and which ones would fall to pieces. And that's a question we have to answer in the church today. You know, it's so easy to be a Christian in our culture. We don't face significant persecution or risk by declaring our faith. There are churches in every community in our nation. And there are Christian television stations and radio stations and Christian movie streaming services and Christian book clubs. Celebrities give their interviews on the faith in Jesus. Just about every major presidential candidate claims to be a Christian or at least to respect Christian values. Christians in our culture look and act just like everybody else. So how do you know the difference? Jesus said in the, the, the difference is found this way. If you love me, keep my commands. That's easy enough. If we love Jesus, we keep his commands. So if we don't keep his commands, no amount of Christian t-shirts or Christian podcasts or soul-searching small group discussions will help. If we love him, we will keep his commands. So what are Jesus' commands? We could look at the very first command Jesus that made in the book of John Chapter 1, verse 43, when he told Philip, follow me. Or we could look at the last command in John 21, 22, when he told Peter, you must follow me. But in between these first and last chapters, Jesus gave a crystal clear command that was at the very heart of his ministry 2,000 years ago and is still the heart of the ministry to this very day. It's in John 13, 34 and 35. So now I am giving you a new commandment. Love each other just as I have loved you. You should love each other. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. You know, it's interesting what Jesus left out here. He didn't command the disciples to be eloquent preachers or skilled leaders or courageous witnesses to an unbelieving society. He commanded them to love one another just as he had loved them. A commandment coming from God in flesh is not negotiable. It's not what Jesus wished for us or recommended for us. It's what he commanded us to do. Actually, every one of God's commands is a challenge to us, but it's also a gift to us. God commands, protect, uh, commands, protects us from harm and provides order and justice in human relationships. So we can hear the word command as a, a burden or a challenge, or we can hear it as a gift. And I think that's what Jesus intended with this new commandment. Loving like Jesus loves is a central requirement for discipleship because it gives our 
life purpose. It, it requires sacrifice and it changes lives. First of all, loving like Jesus gives our life purpose. In this sense, Jesus' command is a gift. How many of us know people who are never satisfied, who are always chasing after some accomplishment or milestone that will give them a sense of purpose? It's exhausting and frustrating to build your life around titles or accomplishments or image. When you base your life's purpose on external values or achievements, then you're always living with a divided mind. Nothing is ever good enough. You never know when you have fulfilled your purpose. Jesus gave us a gift when he took this conflict away from us. When Jesus commanded us to love one another uh, as he loved us, he was removing our own agenda and priorities and replacing them with his own. The moment you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, your life purpose becomes loving others like Jesus did. No title or accomplishment can provide the joy and satisfaction of putting love into action on behalf of others. When Roger was in junior high, his parents divorced and he moved to Ohio with his mother and siblings into a crowded house. He spent most nights sleeping on a cold floor or in a tiny closet. And Roger remembers he said, it's just the situation we were in. Roger's childhood struggles taught him to be sensitive to others' needs and to build his life around something more than his own happiness. And then one day, Roger came across the statistics of how many children didn't have beds in his home county of Lorain, Ohio. And stunned by this, information, he decided to do something about it. He found a nonprofit organization in Idaho called Sleepy, Sleep in Heavenly Peace. That makes uh, bunk beds for children in need. Roger flew to Idaho to learn how to make the bunk beds, and then he flew back to Ohio to start a chapter of this nonprofit in his hometown. He recruited a team of volunteers and sponsors, and they began making bunk beds for children in need in Lorain, Ohio. It's all worth it when you see the smiles on the faces of the kids, Roger says. He goes on to say, there was this one little girl who asked, why are you doing this? And I told her, because we love you. Roger found his life's purpose in building bunk beds for children who didn't have a bed. In other words, he found his life purpose in loving others. And his commitment to this purpose brings him great joy and inspires and touches the lives of others. Jesus' mission and message live on in his work. Also, loving like Jesus requires sacrifice. Sacrificing some part of yourself for something or someone you love only enlarges your love and grows you into a person that God created you to be. In fact, I would uh, argue that sacrifice is the greatest proof of love. Jesus told his disciples in our passage for today that if we love him, then he will show himself to us. What an astonishing promise. Jesus will show himself to those who love him. And Jesus gave us the ultimate example of sacrificing himself for those that he loved. So when we sacrifice ourselves in an act of love, we're letting the spirit of Jesus come alive in us. Let me tell you about a, a Christian woman by the name of Marie Dyer. Marie was born in 1837 on the mission field in China. Her parents died when Marie was young and she was sent to live with relatives in England. But Marie 
caught her parents' missionary spirit, even though that they, they were no longer with her physically. At age 16, she and her sister returned to China to serve as missionaries themselves. A few years later, Marie married a missionary man named Hudson Taylor, a name that you may recognize. The two of them worked to disciple the Christian people in Ningboa and to care for many destitute Chinese children. Their ministry together was powerful but tragically short. Marie died of cholera at the age of 43, but her tombstone bore these words. For her to live was Christ and to die was gain. Marie Dyer Taylor understood the sacrifices that God was calling her to make. Her parents had died in the mission field. Four of her children died on the mission field. Other Christian organizations often criticized the Taylor ministry. But none of these heartbreaks or frustrations affected her commitment. She always knew that she would give up her life to spread the message of Jesus to the Chinese people. Loving like Jesus requires sacrifice. Finally, loving like Jesus changes lives. Love is the most powerful force in the universe because it has the power of life in it. It has the power to create new things, to open minds, to heal hearts, to unite enemies, to make a difference. You cannot carry the power of love in your heart and mind and not be changed. This is how Jesus fulfilled his promise that he will show himself to those who love him. When we love like Jesus, he changes our identity and our priorities into his identities, and his priorities. And that change doesn't just affect our lives, it affects all of those around us too. I want each of you to think back to events in your life when people have showed love to you. When that happens, it's almost impossible to not affect you and your life. I remember one time when my daughter had a, a bad injury to her ankle and she had to have surgery. A friend from a church that Kim didn't even attend put together meals for her and her family. They had two kids at the time. So every night for a week there was a hot meal brought to their house. That changed my daughter's family in their life. I remember times in my life when people have showed love to me throughout my life, many times. Times when I've been sick or had surgery. People from the churches I served, this church, family members brought food. I've had people mow my yard, go get groceries for us. Bring us gifts. How can that not touch your heart? John Wesley talked about his heart being strangely warmed. I think that's a great description of what love can do. But it isn't just the times when we have had somebody minister to us and show love to us. I think we experience that love even more when we're the ones sharing love. That's when our hearts are really, really strangely warmed. I believe that you as individuals and as a corporate body of Christ have done so many things for so many people that it's impossible for you to not have a really warm heart. I remember the man in Buckner in a trailer house that needed help and this church came through no questions asked. I remember the two ladies in Buckner that needed assistance, one having a child that had been through so many surgeries and needed diapers, and you came through. No questions asked. I remember how when this COVID thing began, 
and we weren't meeting but through technology word got out that there were supplies that were needed at community service league and you came through no questions asked each of you has a story to tell about how your heart was strangely warmed i've shared that i really love to do mission trips throughout my ministry and especially when we went to the Appalachian Mountains. Seeing the conditions that these people lived in really almost breaks your heart. I remember one family, a man and his wife, both of them were around 40 years old. He was uh, disabled. They lived on like $700 a month. They lived in a house with no running water except for a hydrant about 100 feet from the house, and they would have to fill buckets and carry the water inside the house. The inside of the house wasn't finished. Wood floors of rough, used wood and a roof that leaked. One of our tasks on that mission trip was to put a new roof on this house. When we arrived that first day, this young lady had made a sign welcoming us and thanking us for coming. She had very little education. You could tell by the sign. It, it was really difficult to read because of the grammatical errors. But it was genuinely from the heart so much so that it brought many of us to tears as she hugged us and welcomed us to her house. When I first went for training to lead mission trips, the first and often thing said was, we weren't there to finish a project, but our main focus was to share the love of Jesus Christ with these families. Many times I experience Christ's love through these beautiful people and even more than I, than I shared with them. Christ said that he would send the advocate, the Holy Spirit, to guide us in sharing love. That feeling that we get when we receive or share the love of Christ to me is a Holy Spirit moment. I praise God for sending Christ to live in this world, to die for us. And I praise God for sending the Holy Spirit to dwell among us. Praise God. Amen.